Hello, and welcome to the Marketing Times Analytics Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Safranis, and today I'm on with Sonia Klucharova. Sonia, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So first of all, thank you, Alex, for having me on the podcast again. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm originally from Slovakia, as you can tell from my accent. I got my PhD in business administration with a concentration in marketing from the University of Central Florida. I'm a consumer behavior researcher, and I currently work as an assistant professor of marketing at the University of Nebraska at Homer. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about your background and specifically how you became interested in disabled influencer marketing. Sure. It all started when I was reading through my Google News feed, and there was an article that popped up about disabled influencers, and I got very interested in it, so I read that article. Then I read some additional articles on disabled influencers, but those were all popular media articles, right? As a good academic, of course, the first thing I did was I tried to look into the academic literature to see how much has been done on disabled influencer marketing in terms of academic research. And to my surprise, I did not find a lot, right? So there were some studies, but it was very limited existing literature on disabled influencer marketing. So I decided to change that. So that's how it all started. Oh, that's awesome. And now a quick word from our sponsor for this episode, Adverity. Is your marketing team drowning in data? With so many platforms and sources, it can be overwhelming. If you're spending more time organizing data than analyzing it, you're not alone. But what if you had a solution that makes your marketing data work for you? Introducing Adverity, the platform that helps you build a unified and accurate data foundation. Adverity integrates and transforms all of your marketing data in one place, allowing your marketing and analytics teams to spot trends, optimize performance, and drive results faster. No more guessing and no more data chaos, just insights that matter. Trusted by global brands like Amex, Ikea, and Red Bull, Adverity has helped businesses gain a competitive advantage and unlock their full potential. Ready to make your data extraordinary? Visit adverity.com and book your demo today. That's adverity, A-D-V-E-R-I-T-Y dot com, because your data deserves better. Thanks. And now back to the episode. Is there anything else that inspired your research on disabled social media influencers? Really, I just felt that they should be given more visibility and that marketing academics and marketing practitioners would be aware that such influencers exist and they should start collaborating with them, right? And another big reason for my specific research was that the research that was already out there on disabled influencer marketing was more from the perspective of influencers themselves. So how they are portrayed, how they would like to be portrayed, et cetera. Researchers did some interviews with disabled influencers, for example. But I was wondering how the audience, how the consumers perceive disabled influencers and more specifically how they perceive products promoted by disabled social media influencers. So as a consumer behavior researcher, of course, I was interested in the consumer opinion, right? And that was the part that was missing. So I, I did not find any studies dealing with how consumers perceive products promoted by disabled social media influencers. So how can you describe some of the unique challenges faced by disabled social media influencers? Sure. From my perspective, and again, as a disclaimer, I'm not a disabled influencer myself. So, you know, I probably don't have the right to speak on behalf of this specific group. But again, from my understanding, there are several challenges that they face in the online environment and also for media, such as ableism, discrimination, so no surprise there, unfortunately. And also, I would say there are disabled influencers who have invisible disability. And those might get questioned whether they are really disabled because that disability is not visible to the audience. So again, there might be some bullying and questioning in that regard. And then the other thing I would say would be the accessibility of social media platforms. So those might not always be as accessible as they should be to disabled people and disabled influencers in particular. So 
how do disabled influencers navigate accessibility issues on social media platforms? Let's so I would say it really depends on the specific disability that they have, right? So whether they have, let's say, visual impairment or whether they have limited mobility or restricted um, mobility. And there are certain ways in which they can navigate this. For example, they can increase the text size. They can use screen readers if they are visually impaired. They can also use voice control features. And they can also use different assistive technologies, for example, adaptive mouth stickers and different eye tracking technology. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's good to know that the social media platforms are adapting to all different kinds of users. Okay. So and they get more content. Absolutely. And they should be doing more moving forward. What role do disabled influencers play in changing perceptions of disability in society? I would say that they can definitely help remove stigma associated with disability. So that's a big one. And they can also use their platform to advocate for inclusion. So again, I think that's very important. And they also can educate the general public about different forms of disability, right? And different types of disability. So as I mentioned before, not all disabilities are visible and disabled influencers can actually use their platform to educate the public about those different types of disabilities, including the invisible disability. In your opinion, why do people respond more positively to disabled influencers compared to all other influencers? So I can only speak specifically about my own research. In my own research, I looked at consumer responses or perceptions of products pr promoted by disabled influencers. I looked specifically at the perceived luxury of these products. What I found in my research was that consumers perceive disabled influencers as more unique than they perceive non-disabled influencers. So that was one bit, right? And then using the theory um, of psychological contagion, which is uh, basically describing the transfer of essence between people and products, I found that this uniqueness associated with influencers also transfers to the product promoted by these influencers. And since existing research shows a connection between uniqueness and luxury, if you look at, at this whole chain of events that I just described, essentially the outcome is that consumers perceive products promoted by, dis by disabled influencers as more luxurious than they perceive products uh, promoted by non-disabled influencers, right? And again, as I said, this is driven by influencer uniqueness. And then I also wanted to take this a step further. I wanted to look at a more concrete outcome. And since, again, prior research shows us that perceived luxury is usually connected with greater willingness to pay for the product, because obviously, if you think that something is more luxurious, you are typically willing to pay more for it. So taking this a step further, I also show that consumers are willing to pay more for products promoted by disabled influencers, as opposed to the products promoted by non-disabled influencers. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So do you have any examples of disabled influencers? Sure. Uh, there are quite a few of them uh, out there. I'm just going to mention a couple. So there is, for example, Bernadette Hagens. Uh, she's based in Belfast in Northern Ireland, uh, and she um, has a prosthetic leg. She's a cancer uh, survivor who lost um, her leg due to cancer. Then there is Lauren Wall Spencer. She's using a wheelchair and she's also an actress and influencer. Then there is, for example, Emily Davison. She goes by Fashion Aista and she also has her own blog and she has a visual impairment, hence the name Fashion Aista. Most of these influencers I mentioned they are in the space of fashion and beauty and also doing advocacy for the disabled community. So how do brands approach working with disabled influencers differently? So I would really say that looking at past examples, brands mainly work with disabled to be perceived as more inclusive if they really want to show that representation matters, right? Because if you look at the statistics, I think 16% of the world's population is disabled. But when you look at marketing and advertising campaigns, you will not see so many disabled 
people being represented in those campaigns, right? So if a brand works uh, with a disabled influencer, they're really sending a signal like we are trying to really increase the representation of disabled people in our campaign. So what do you hope to achieve through your research and work in the field of disabled influencer marketing? Really, I would like to increase the visibility of disabled influencers. I hope that there will be more academics research on disabled influencers and why companies should partner with these disabled influencers, just like I showed to my project that if you are a luxury brand, it might be really beneficial for you to work um, with a disabled influencer because such an influencer can increase the perception of luxury um, of your product. So I hope that there will be other academics looking into other potential outcomes, such as the perceived authenticity of, of the product, right? It's authentic than product promoted by a non-disabled influencer, right? And there are other potential future research avenues, right? So maybe some intersectional issues can also be explored, right? So things such as gender, race, things like that. So I'm hoping that future research will look into those issues as well. And my ultimate hope would be that marketing and advertising practitioners also out of this and that they will start implementing this in practice and that they will start working with uh, disabled influencers more. Yeah, I, I hope so. What do you think about the B2B versus B2C space? Is there a better fit for these influencers? Honestly, I would say that's a question for future research. I don't like to make any conclusions unless I have like specific empirical findings to back this up. So maybe B2B versus B2C, right? Is there a difference there? Again, I don't know right now, but I would love to explore this in the future. Yeah. My gut says B2C, but I don't know. A lot of B2B companies, it's the B2B influencer space is dry. I have a feeling B2B would be a tougher place than B2C, but I'm excited to hear your research about it. Yeah, I actually have the same feeling, the same gut feeling that you just described. Hopefully, future research will look into this specific topic. Speaking of potential future projects, do you have any upcoming projects or research that you're working on or you're going to be working on that you can tease out for us? I don't have anything specific that I would be working on yet, but in terms of disabled social media influencers, of course, I have quite a few ideas for future research projects. For example, in my current research, I only looked at influencers with visible disabilities. So if you read my paper in the Journal of Business Research, you will see the pictures, the stimuli that I used in that research, and you will see that those were some visible disabilities. For example, in one study, I have an influencer who has a Down syndrome, and, and you can tell from the picture. Or in another study, I have an influencer who has a prosthetic leg. So again, it's very visible. It's a testament to the robustness of the results because I did not tell my participants that this is a disabled influencer. There was no mention of it whatsoever. I just showed them the picture and they could tell from the picture because all of these were visible disabilities. And I also had some attention to manipulation checks later confirmed that yes, my participants really perceived those influencers as disabled influencers. With invisible disabilities, it could be a bit tricky because you would probably need to tell your audience this is a disabled influencer. Because if somebody has hearing loss, for example, you might not be able to tell by looking at their picture. So I will be curious myself whether those results that I found would hold in the case of invisible disabilities. And again, the experiments will need to be performed a little differently. So there will need to be probably a description saying that this is a disabled influencer. It will also be interesting for future projects to involve actual disabled influencers because all the influencers that I had in my research were fictitious and all the brands I also had in my research were fictitious. So again, it will be interesting to do something with real influencers and real brands, real products. As I mentioned before, there are other potential outcomes that could be studied, such as the perceived authenticity of a product, the perceived durability of the product, things like that. I also looked specifically at physical goods or physical products, and I would be curious to see if this effect also is there, if an influencer promotes a service. And apart from um, the disabled influencer space, looking at the broader picture, I would like to do more work uh, in terms of societal issues. So looking at like different issues in society that are troubling 
For example, one issue that I would really like to explore is domestic violence. And I would like to highlight it especially today because now it's October and October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So that's why I'm reminded of domestic violence and I feel like there needs to be, we need to do more in terms of domestic violence prevention. So for example, I would like to look at the effectiveness of different domestic violence acts, right? In terms of what they display, like the way that they display the victim, what kind of wording they use and what is the most effective way of communicating with the intended audience through this domestic violence. So when you look into the future of marketing for disabled social media influencers, how, what does the future look like? So my hope is that we will see more and more disabled social media influencers going forward, collaborating with disabled social media influencers. Yeah, that makes sense. Is there any type of company or any way to narrow down that vision on which companies should consider hiring these influencers? Based on my research, what I'm really showing is that it would be good and beneficial for luxury companies to work with disabled influencers. And other than that, I can just generally say that if a company wants to be perceived as inclusive, working with a disabled influencer can certainly help. Yeah, the same, that makes a lot of sense. I know a couple of brands who might consider that. Yeah, you might uh, have heard about the Gucci campaign. They actually team up with a disabled model at the time. So they had a campaign, I think it was the Gucci Beauty campaign and the name of the model, it's a British model. Uh, her name is Ellie Golds. So she has a Down syndrome. And at the time when they launched that campaign, like there was a lot of media attention, media coverage of that campaign. So that's actually a good example of a luxury brand working uh, with a disabled individual. Are there any common misconceptions about disabled influencer marketing that you'd like to clear up? So in answering that question, I'm going to be referring not to my own research, but to research done by other researchers, specifically researchers from Sweden, and their names are Södergren and Wallström. So they published a paper in 2023 in the Journal of Marketing Management, where they did a ethnographic study of 12 disabled influencers. The disabled influencers do not want to be portrayed as victims, because there are some people who maybe perceive disabled influencers and disabled individuals as victims, but that's not how they want to be portrayed. They also, disabled influencers also do not want to be portrayed as superhuman. They are especially irritated when you call them inspiring. There is even a term in the academic literature related to that. It's called inspiration porn. And this refers to the portrayal of people with disabilities as inspiring and like this is being overused, right? So whenever we see a disabled person, it's all like, it's so inspiring that they can do this and they can do that despite their disability, right? We tend to perceive them in this way. We tend to say it out loud to them, but it seems that they don't like it. Uh -huh. They don't want to be perceived as inspiring. They just want to be seen as complex human beings, according to this research that I mentioned. And they also don't want people to have pity for them. And they don't want to be portrayed in such a way in order so as to elicit pity. They want to be seen and perceived as complex human beings. So not victims, not superhumans, not somebody who would be inspired. Wow. Yeah, it reminds me of the Mr. Beast backlash. Mm -hmm. where, you know, he does all these amazing things to help people. And frankly, I support that. If he happens to be running his business, but also helping people, most businesses don't have that much philanthropic value. We don't have problems with those. Maybe we do. Maybe there's some people who are against all of them. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm happy that he's doing something uh, philanthropic as well. But a lot of people see it as using other people's misfortune as, as a way to get views. There's a interesting backlash of something you think is good on the surface it seems virtuous and good but then you have to look at the underlying motivations behind all of these things and i could see how if a brand is using for instance only disabled social media influencers or is portraying them in this sort of way that they don't like to be portrayed maybe in a amplified way i could see how that could be a problem so this definitely is tricky and would you say that's why there hasn't been that much adoption of disabled social media influencers 
what are the sort of reasons why it's not more common than it is? Yeah, that could definitely be one of the reasons. Maybe companies are very careful about it. They don't know because it might be difficult to strike the right balance between portraying disabled influencers as empowering versus portraying them as maybe inspiring, which they may not like, right? So again, for a company, it might not always be easy to strike the right balance, right? Not to portray them as victims, but not to portray them as superhumans, on the other hand. So that's why I think it's very important that we give disabled social media influencers the voice so they can tell us themselves like how they feel, how they want to be portrayed, what works best for them instead of making those assumptions, right? Because we might make an assumption that, oh, they want to be seen as inspiring. Maybe it strikes their ego. Maybe they like it. But once you start interviewing them, once, once you start looking at it through their lens, through their eyes, you will realize that maybe that's not what they want. So that's why it is important to talk to them, to understand what they want, what they need, how they want to be portrayed. Yeah. How do you measure the success of a disabled influencer marketing campaign? So just like with any influencer marketing campaign, it can be tricky. You might look at certain um, things such as uh, tracking impressions, uh, engagement rate, conversion rate, but revenue earned from the influencer campaign in general can be tricky to measure because sometimes you cannot really tell whether a product was purchased because of an influencer campaign or because of different reasons, unless you include like specific link into the influencer post, you know, that customers can click and that it will take them directly to the website where they can make a purchase. Uh, so that's one way of directly tracking it. But if you don't do it, it might be tricky to measure it. So that's definitely one issue uh, related uh, to influencer marketing in general. Yeah. So this question relates to what we were talking about before with how it can be a little bit tricky. And that is uh, what ethical considerations are important in disabled influencer marketing? So really, I would just circle back uh, to what I said before. You should not ban disabled influencers. You should not portray them as victims. You should not portray them in a way that people will have pity for them because that's not the way that they would like to be portrayed. But on the other hand, you might also not want to portray them as super, super human creatures. So those would be some important ethical considerations from my perspective. Yeah. So you're saying really just treat them like everybody else, right? Exactly. As human beings, because that's how they want to be treated, just like everybody else. Can you describe any intersectional issues faced by disabled influencers, such as race, gender, or socioeconomic mm -hmm. status? So this is something that I would really like to look at in my future research. I think it's very interesting to look at those intersectional issues. And I would be curious to see uh, what I find or what other researchers uh, may find. What do you think makes disabled influencer marketing unique compared to other forms of influencer marketing? What makes it unique? Again, I would say when you choose a product that you want to promote through disabled influencers, you should be carefully choose what product it is going to be, right? And how you want that product to be portrayed. Drawing on my own research again, if you want that product to be perceived as more luxurious, in that case, you might want to work with a disabled influencer, for example. So really just keeping in mind how you want your product, how you want your brand to be perceived. And if a disabled influencer can help you fulfill that perception and fulfill that mission, whether a disabled influencer would be right for that and really do not portray them as victims, do not try to elicit pity for them. So that's one thing that you need to be very careful with when you work with disabled influencers, as opposed to working with non-disabled influencers. So thinking more broadly about society, how can disabled influencer marketing contribute to a more inclusive society? So really, I would say by increasing representation of disabled people in marketing and advertising campaigns. Going back to what I said before, roughly 16% of the world's population is disabled, but we do not really see that sort of representation in marketing and advertising campaign. So that's, in my opinion, the most important thing to take into consideration here to really increase that representation and create a more inclusive society. 
What advice do you have for brands or individuals looking to get involved with disabled influencer marketing? So my first advice would be do it. Just do it. Get in touch with those disabled influencers. Consider collaborating with them. If you don't know where to start, the good news is that there are already some marketing agencies specialized in disabled influencer marketing. I will mention a very popular one. It's based in the UK and it's called the Purple Gold. It is an award-winning disabled influencer marketing agency, and really their mission is to increase the representation of disabled influencers. This agency was founded by a disabled individual, and really they focus on disabled influencer marketing. If you don't know where to start, try to get in touch with an agency such as the Purple Gold. Yeah. I just had an idea, as you were saying, that I think one of the reasons why it works well, the disabled influencer marketing, is because it's different and luxury products need to stand out. They need to be surprising and new and different and catch your attention. And I think that it works because it's not as common. And I'm curious to see how that evolves. Like direct mail, it worked until it didn't. And now people have gotten so accustomed to just throwing away their mail. The more we have it, the less we appreciate it, like a rule. And I think that it'd be interesting to see where disabled social media influencers level out in terms of like their popularity in advertising, because I think right now it's below where it should be. And I think that over the next decade, it it will increase. Perceived luxuriousness changes if all of a sudden double the number of brands are using it or triple the number of brands are now using social media, disabled social media influencers in their ads. I'd be curious to see how that evolves in the future. Exactly. Same here, because I could very clearly see in my results that those disabled influencers are perceived as unique, as scarce, as extraordinary. So those are, as you correctly pointed out, qualities which are associated with luxury, right? Because if something is luxury, it's usually unique, it's extraordinary, it's scarce, just like those influencers. Maybe as they become more popular disabled influencers, people might not perceive them as unique to such a great extent anymore. Uh, But right right now I do because, you know, they're they're pretty scarce still. So that's that's why probably I found what I found in my research. I would be curious if this result will hold um, once disabled social media influencers become more popular and once there are more of those influencers out there. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite things to think about is like, how can we use this hypothesis to set up a test? The... What we're thinking about is people respond to types of people that are rare. Are there any other types of people that are rare that that are currently not featured in ads, but could be? I don't know. We could test it. I really love that you're doing this research and I'm excited to hear about how it evolves. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sonia. And thanks everyone for listening. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Alex. Sorry.